thank you all for joining me on your very last day of Code on the Beach. I'm happy to see some familiar faces and people I bribed at happy hour to come listen to me talk today. Um, so I'm Mary Sheridan. Um, I am one of our modeling and analytics team leads at NLP Logics here in Jacksonville. NLP Logics is a AI automation data science firm who builds various data solutions for different clients of all um, vendors or verticals and industries. So um, this topic is very pertinent to what we do, but um, often is, is, is going to be a growing and growing importance for pretty much everyone in the tech community. So wanted to um, hopefully have a little bit of a discussion as well in here as we tell you a little bit about what we're doing on this front, uh, understand a little bit about maybe what you guys are starting to do. But before I begin, I just want to make sure we're all clear what I'm talking about when I say model health is not this. Okay, so some people get confused when I say model health, they're not familiar with the term. But we're talking about predictive models, AI automation. Um, and I also wanted to kind of get an understanding of who's in our audience today. So uh, who here is actually responsible for personally building models? Who is actually a developer building models, predictive models, automation, anyone? Ha Anyone have a team that is building models? Perfect, perfect. Um, what about anyone work for a company that their products use models or automation? Do we have any of those? Oh, perfect, perfect. And then is there anyone in the audience who is basically an end user? You hire out a company to build models? Anyone? Okay. So all across the board, perfect. Um, so basically just kind of setting the stage for the importance of model health. So as we all know, automation is really growing, and that's great. We love that. Um, but there's you know, a lot of trust in the community that we really need to earn and gain through this process. So you know, a quick fact from McKinsey, 50% of businesses have adopted AI in, the, in at least at one business function in 2020, and we know why. Obviously, there's so much to be gained by automation. So really, everyone's coming to us saying, hey, we want to um, we want to reduce costs, uh, reduce labor costs, but also increase efficiencies. So they're looking for us and the community to really deliver on that. So we spend all this time with clients really trying to understand their business problem. We spend hours and hours building, iterating models, iterating these products, trying to get that accuracy to that level that, you know, meets that client acceptance. But then what happens afterwards? What happens after your model is deployed? Do you know? Yes, we look, usually monitor, hypercare, that sort of thing, but what about three months from now, six months from now, 12 months from now? People are using deployed models from years ago. How do we know that's still accurate? It's still delivering the value prop that we, we set out to, to solve. If you have clients, how do they know it's working? It's usually black box. They can't check anything. They just see, hey, I'm routing stuff to you, and you're routing stuff back. Seems to be working. How do you know, as the, if you built it, that it's still working? Same thing. A lot of times we have system performance metrics. We're seeing, oh, we processed 10,000 records today. Must be good. But how do we know it's really accurate? So how can our, you, as a, if you're a builder, or you as a client, feel comfortable that all that money you spent, all that time you spent, it, it, it's you're getting that value. You, you, companies spend hundreds of thousands of millions on these things, not just in the implementation, but also in process. They're teaming up staff. They're um, in, you know, training people how to interpret these things. They're building business logic around it. Uh, they're creating all new departments around these things, and they need to protect that, that value. So how do we, as a community, really come together to help preserve and maintain that trust? Because we want to see automation grow. We see the value. We know the value. But we want to make sure that our end users do too. So that's kind of where model health monitoring comes in. It's a really hot topic right now. Um, and it's kind of, I think we're all starting to realize the risk if we're not monitoring that value. So model health monitoring is really a way to proactively detect some of those problems before they become huge issues and really impact those end business decisions. 
So generally when people think of model health, performance, they think more of those system metrics and they think, oh, implementation is their busy, our biggest risk and errors in that. But really there are a lot of common threats to model health that you may not be aware of or that are pretty common that we need to be cognitive of as we um, roll out our, and deploy. So the first one is really non-representative training data. So this one, I think people just assume the data that they're getting to train their model represents the future. So a model only knows what it knows. We've, it's gonna learn from the past, and the assumption is the future is gonna look like the past, but that's not always the case. Additionally, sometimes clients just don't have all the right data at that time. They're building something, and it's, maybe they only have a subset from one business unit, one location, you know, so there may be times they know that and they can tell you in advance so we can plan for that risk, but there may be times that the client doesn't even know that that data that they provided you isn't representative of everything that the model's gonna see, or the client may not know the risk of throwing other things into the model. So we've worked with people who, oh, we rolled out a whole new product line, a whole new business unit, we just jammed it in there, ooh, like, and you're making decisions on that? We don't know if their behaviors are the same as what you train that model on. So that's one risk. Second risk, I think, probably now we're a little more cognitive of, um, but there are changes that happen naturally in the population, but there are also things like COVID. Uh, who's here has tried to make sense of some of that historical data we have? We used to have years and years of historical data. What do we do with 2020? Can we use that? Is that, is that representative of future behavior? Is that today? And do we even know is our behaviors today? Can we use data from 2021? Can we use 2022? We don't know, because we don't know what the, what's gonna happen. Is this the new normal? But COVID's kind of an extreme example, but populations evolve over time for an, a variety of reasons. There's new technology that comes out, new competitors, just um, things phase out, things phase in. People change, the world changes. So naturally, models tend to degrade just because normal changes in the population. And then there could be other things like new legislation, new laws, um, stimulus checks, change behaviors. So there's just different things that happen that we may not think about that can occur while you're, mo and we're not thinking about those things to think, how is that impacting our model? We just are kind of going about assuming that everything is the same. The final one, which is the fun one, a lot of times people don't realize when you change your systems and the source data, that can impact your model. So a lot of our clients don't realize that. They, oh, we implemented a new CRM system. Oh, well, um, now that field that was required that is a top feature in our model is not included on every record. They don't think about those things. Uh, so really understanding that source data, the dependencies on that data, on its formats, um, its inclusion, its missingness, um, really having those conversations to make sure that people realize if you have a business process built on this model, you got, you, it's a partnership. What you put in is only, you're only gonna get as good as, out of it as what you put into it. So let's have that conversation and make sure that we're aware of what that source data is looking like over time. So this is a, a real example of what happens when models are in the wild and it's not monitored. So this is an example of a legacy model we had running for, I think, years. And uh, we decided, hey, look, we're, gonna, we're starting to implement model health. Let's retroactive implement it. Let's start looking at all these old, old models. And the chart on the left is the training model, what we gave to the client. This is what we promised. This is what we expect. This is how it should be. This is how they, they, we made recommendations on business process. Nice, beautiful, smooth curve as we expect. Propensity scores ranging from zero to 0.7. And now today, let's look at that. Ooh, this looks nothing like that. Uh, the new, the model is now spitting out propen like propensity scores half the size, so up to 0.35, and the shape is totally different. So what's going on here? This is our worst case scenario, but this is why model health is important because you would be so surprised how often this is happening and no one knows. Has anyone had an experience like this? Anyone? How did you guys kind of investigate what, what went wrong? Uh, we just reengaged a feature engineer, so we used uh, a technical tool to roll out some of the top features and then we just 
Anyone else? Link training now, the latest data that you might be getting so that way you can improve the product package. Yep. Yeah, so sometimes, you know, retraining is the answer. But what we found with this, there were some issues that retraining would not have fixed. So that's why model health, like, uh, why we're such big fans of model health, because these are surfacing issues that aren't even on the model's end. Um, so we saw a lot of those issues that I talked about that are threats to model health. So one was, and I'm sorry, this PowerPoint got all jacked up. Um, <laughs> the percent of missing, so the top feature we saw, um, the source data just, we saw this slight and gradual incline in uh, the missing data. So what's going on there? Why is that missing? That's a huge impact to the model. And then we also saw in the box plot chart, you'll see the second most important feature just dropped. We, we saw that they're mostly feeding us zeros. And when we had this huge range of values, now the majority are at zero. But the model's not gonna fail because of that. It has an input. It expects an input in a numerical fashion. It sees that, it runs. But the prediction is gonna be wildly off. And then we saw also just more of that population trend. We, we also saw, hey, um, I think this was income, we also noticed the population that you're scoring on is changing itself. So we saw enough here to say, hey, A, there's some work you guys need to do to investigate. Why is this missing? Is this going to continue to be missing? Or is there something, a failure on your end? Um, and then try to understand, did you change anything? Did you add a new group of folks to your population? Do we need to have two separate models for them? Um, really engaging them to determine the next course of action. Um, we did end up retraining, knowing um, they did some work on there and fixed um, some of the missings, and then uh, we moved forward from there. But basically by being proactive and being able to monitor these things, so this was a retrospective, but the goal is to be, to we build these in parallel with our models. So when we're implementing our model from day one in production, model health goes out with it so that we're able to really catch those things early and ongoing so that it's not, oh crap, when did this happen? How, how have you been using this? You know, those are scary conversations and no one wants to be on that end. So the benefits, first, if you're, you're, you're gonna catch those implementation issues. So sometimes moving from test to prod, things don't always pair up. Um, something can go wrong. Someone can push out a, a different code change. So we're gonna catch those right away, uh, but we're also going to catch those things that evolve over time. So when source data changes, we're able to really identify that and talk to the client and remediate it immediately versus waiting for it to cause a huge business impact. Um, we also get to engage the client and really understand how are you using this model? Do you use the propensity scores or are you using deciles? Because if you're using, one, you know, if you have hard and fast business rules based on a propensity score, in that prior model, if they made rules of anyone over 0.4, no one would be targeted. Uh, so really understanding how they're using it, making sure they're using it correctly to account for it if there are gradual decay in the model. And then finally, really driving that communication awareness. Clients need to know that, hey, and if you're an end user, hey, our source data matters. And you may not be in charge of that source data. You may have to engage other departments, like the marketing department or other departments in IT that you know own different data assets. And if they're changing a um, platform or a process, you need to be in the loop because there are consequences if if you're not. Um, so really spawning that communication and then communicating with our clients that, hey, you need to also tell us. Don't blame us if the model is not working. If you're feeding it things it doesn't expect. So I'm gonna go a little bit into some of the key metrics that are typically monitored. So these are some um, really easy wins to monitor and really detect the majority of issues that are gonna come about. Um, and these are pretty standard. So the first one is um, data completeness. So this is a kind of easy one. We saw that case example where a percent missing really um, was causing some issues. So really just tracking what, what does that source data look like? What percent is missing? How much do we expect to be missing? Does that deviate? 
What are the formats? Are all the formats looking right? And then for those categorical variables, looking at that range of values. So this one's pretty handy um, because, you know, if you do have categoricals, say you're training on bananas and you have trained it on green and yellow and everything in between, but all of a sudden now you got blue bananas, the model's not going to know what to do with that and it's not going to be able to handle that. So we want to detect, hey, you're feeding different data in here. We need to retrain the model to know how to adapt to that. The second main um, kind of group of metrics is really focus on feature drift. So really understanding that everything that's going in has that same distribution as what the model expects. So um, really just kind of comparing that distribution because this is where you're going to detect changes in behavior. You can also detect some of those changes in source systems, but this is going to detect some of those subtle changes in the population. As we see maybe the means drift over, the distribution change, um, we want to make sure that it's consistent because the behaviors of the population are going to relate to the target. So we want to make sure that each of the behaviors that we're, we're classifying can really, um, is really represented correctly. So there's a, uh, several common metrics used out there, um, the Characteristic Stability Index, uh, the KS test, um, some other um, distribution tests, chi-square tests. So um, there's a wide variety of tests out there just depending on the type of data that you're comparing um, to really kind of track those changes. And then obviously prediction drift. So we want to make sure what's coming out of the model is also looking right. Um, so very similar to feature drift. Uh, and here the kind of the gold standard has been the PSI, uh, which is similar to the CSI. But again, it's just tracking that distribution and making sure it's similar to what um, the training model provided. And then ideally performance stability. So this is the hardest one. This is probably gonna be the biggest one to draw attention to problems with your model is when you know, measuring, is this still at the same accuracy level, precision? What's the AUC curve look like? But this is the hardest to get. So this requires getting the actuals back. And then it's always, there's always a delay in that. So you're, there's always gonna be a time delay before you can get the actual. So depending on what you're, you're targeting. Um, so while this is ideal, the other three can actually do a lot of work for you and catch a lot of things before it starts to impact accuracy. But again, we try to get this as we can because a lot of times there are key performance metrics or your client expects, hey, when we train this model, it was, you said it was 85%. Like, that's what I expect and that's what you promised me. So some people, you know, if we can get that data, I think that's um, super valuable, but it's just not always the case. So we try to leverage um, the other metrics as much as we can. So I've kind of talked a lot about model health more in that kind of traditional predictive model tabular sense. But what we're doing is we're really trying to find ways to use this concept and apply it to all sorts of other automation and other types of models. And we're actually having good success with that. So um, we're applying these concepts to OCR, computer vision, as well as robotic process. So when we talk about features, we have to kind of generate them. So if it's not a tabular model, they may not have features. We can generate features to track to see that that input data, is that changing? So for OCR, we try to um, get all the characteristics of the documents. So what's the percent of black pixels, percent of white pixels, aspect ratio, number of pages, anything that can kind of clue us in or help with root cause analysis if we start to see performance change. Um, and then we just look for the prediction. We look more for that classification. Are we getting more exceptions? Are we seeing a shift in what's being labeled? Um, and then that, that matching rate. So we use a you know, like fuzzy matching to say how, how well does this match to the, the reference list. And if we start to see that degrade, you know, that we would want to question that and start to investigate what's going on. Is it the source data? Is it a technology problem? Um, is it both? For computer vision, very similar to OCR, we again try to um, capture um, different characteristics of, of the images. Um, so for this one, we actually had a client that um, basically takes uh, images, takes pictures of um, like a train car, basically, and there's so there's multiple cameras set up and it goes through a bay and it takes pictures. Well, they replaced one of the cameras same make, same model camera, just new. 
Well, the images coming out of that camera were much brighter than the rest and of, uh, of the other cameras, and all the training data was from those other cameras. So we started seeing the model performance drop, and we had to investigate why. So with model health, we can start detecting those things, root cause faster, and be able to adapt and retrain the model with those images. Um, for robotic process, so this one's a little different in concept uh, as far as like what we're pro robotic process kind of we put in and put out, but we're still trying to apply that the same principle. How can we detect issues? So with um, one client, we have their um, core business is really um, going in and basically having bots click buttons and download documents and save them and go through pick lists and um, really to automate that. And so what we were seeing is some of that is based on templates, some is based on OCR, um, but some of those templates may be outdated. There may be a UI change from the ER, the electronic medical record system um, that we don't know about and we can't see. So we may start seeing slowing, we may start seeing failures where in certain steps, we need to evaluate what's happening there. Why is the bot tripping up in this area before we just start having um, you know, overall failure rate dropping in the process, it can't work at all. So we want to start seeing, are we seeing slowing down? Do the template, templates need to be refreshed? Do we need to uh, apply more OCR for this button? How do we make it so that we can prevent these things from happening and having these catastrophic impacts to our clients? So where do you start? So there's a ton of open source products out here. Has anyone have experience with any of these? Has anyone heard of these? Okay, so I can't speak to the pros and cons of each of these, but these are some, there's plenty out there, um, and there's just a lot of documentation, so it's a great place to start if you're, you want to start understanding how do we go about this. Um, we evaluated these, um, there's, again, there's pros and cons just depending on your projects, your types of models, your automation, some of them may not fit your needs. Um, there's, they also have kind of embedded reporting built in, so you know, it's a great way to start if you don't know where to start. Um, or you can go our route where you just build your own. The concepts are pretty basic. You know, I kind of walk through them. They're the PSI calculations, a lot of those distribution tests, they're in a lot of those products open source codes. You can lever the, leverage those functions. They're all Python based. So for us, this allows us to have a lot more flexibility. Um, the open source just wasn't fitting our needs. We have so many different projects, so many different types of technology. We just cannot do a one size fits all. Um, but we were able to leverage some concepts from them. And then the other benefits of building your own is that um, you, know, you may have KPIs you wanna build in there that are unique to each client. And you can integrate into your own reporting system. So you know, we wanna build a way so that we can hand off model health to offshore and it's clear and it's easy to detect problems. You don't have to be a statistician, you don't have to um, be a developer, but you can look at a chart like that and say, hmm, something's off here. These don't look right. Um, so we wanted to be able to kind of simplify some of that reporting to make it easier to understand and even um, have a nice way to show the client so they understand what's happening. We also found we wanted to test some of the metrics. So there's a wide variety of metrics. Each kind of used different ones. But we wanted to test in parallel to say, hey, is, which ones do we like best for model health? Which ones are really suiting our needs? So this allowed us to do that testing um, and figure out what was right for us. And then we're embedding this really into a core part of our support process. Um, we really want to engage the client on this. We want to have them in the conversation. Um, we want them to know, A, we got your back. You're spending a lot of money, you're trusting us, we're gonna, help, we're gonna monitor that, we're gonna make sure it's working for you, uh, and so we're gonna give you updates. And then it helps broaden that dialogue so they can feel comfortable and they can report back out to their teams and their stakeholders and say, I, I feel good about this, everything's look good, or they can hand this to maybe a business user who is responsible for a data source that is maybe not functioning, like, hey, this is the impact. You know, we got to work together. Um, so really just having that open dialogue, making sure that they're engaged and that they can help uh, be a partner. We can partner and they have to, we, we have to rely on each other to make sure that their automation and their models are successful. So just kind of summarizing some of those 
benefits to really drive that value. Um, really, we want to drive that reassurance. We want automation to continue to grow. We see that value. We need our clients and users to understand that. But it also shows, hey, I, if you build a model, you should, you're should you gonna be the expert in it. The client isn't, they don't know what's in there, they don't understand. We need to be that expert, guide them on that journey, make those recommendations of when to retrain, when to rebuild. There may be times that a retrain is not gonna fix it. We need to go down a different path here. Um, and then just, you know, really creating that trust. So, you know, we, that, hey, we got your back. We know this is valuable. We know you're, you're putting a lot on here. You gotta convince people to go down this route of automation. Um, we're gonna make sure it's, it's delivering. And then finally, just deepening, deepening that relationship. It kind of goes together with trust. You know, we want, we want a partner and we don't wanna just build and walk away. These, I mean, we invest a lot of time and heartache and sweat into some of these things and, and we get invested in the, our business partners and we believe in them and we want them to grow and, and be successful. So really having those open dialogues and being transparent helps deepen that relationship to make sure that you know, they know we're not just here to build something and walk away. You know, we want to make sure they're successful. Um, so we do have a white paper. If, if, there's, if you want to share some of this information with any of your stakeholders, you can download it. It's not one of those sales forms. You don't have to fill in anything. It's just a click and you download. And so it has all these concepts kind of written out. Um, if you want to share that with anyone in your uh, organization, um, feel free to reach out to me. I also have my boss and our CIO in the back corner as well. Um, but I'd love to now just kind of open it up to more of an open dialogue and kind of understand, you know, what issues are you seeing um, and any questions you may have about model health. So this model that you're talking about, uh, is it a retrospective model, like a weekly or monthly, or is it something real time? What situations will you real time and what situations will you so we try to do, uh, it, it, it depends. So I think there are cases where we're uh, retrospective is when we have very little data coming through and we need to have enough to have statistical variability to test. Um, but we try to do it usually at least weekly uh, so that we can be on top of it. So we just take the last seven days and roll it up. Um, but there may be cases where daily is needed, um, especially maybe early on in after implementation, we want to say, is this working? Is this working? Is this working? Like, let's, let's check it. So usually we may start with a, a more frequent cadence and then slow down. And then there are some models that are very stable. So there are clients that send us a batch and that data doesn't change. They just append in maybe a few records and maybe shift a few numbers, but that data is so stable that we can run it just monthly. Um, so it kind of depends on the, the use case and then the risk involved with, with the model. What's the typical time frame that you suggest to retrain? We don't have a typical. We go by the data. We say, hey, is this looking good? Is it accurate? Is it, do we have drift? Um, if, there, if it's stable and looking good, no need to retrain. But if it's within one month looking wonky, okay, we need to retrain that. There's something seriously wrong. Or we need to assess if we need to rebuild it. So we're, we're moving away from that traditional, like, let's schedule retrains because if there are mis is missing data or some source system issues, we're we're going to miss that. Retraining is not going to help. We're going to wind up with the same um, crappy you know curve at the end. So that's kind of our the way we're migrating. Kind of related to that. It sounds like this at least once a week, you know, depending on the model. Is it more manual intervention, or do you go into place into your own? You mentioned the blue bananas. Do you have an only protection? Do you have different other techniques and tools that you're implementing inside of the materials? Sure, I'll talk a little bit and I'll let Matt speak a little bit. Um, so we're we're kind of maturing in our endeavor. So this is kind of uh, we're just kind of stepping in and maturing. We do want, we are building those automatic processes. So some you know had to be retrofitted. We're retrospective. But now any new model build, we're building that process in, we're pulling out breadcrumbs that normally we wouldn't even store. So anything the model's generating and features and even um, aspects of that metadata from you know, documents um, so that we can get some of that, those more sophisticated techniques um, in and, and really um, have it ready to go in parallel. 
I don't know if you, Matt, you have anything additional to say there? Um, yeah, sure. I'll actually, one comment to on the previous one. So I love the point about when do we retrain? Like, I feel like that is the old way of thinking. To Mary's point, it really is, like there's risk in retraining and redeploying a model. And we're definitely pivoting that to um, have it based on health and KPIs. You go into it ahead of time. So enough with the periodic, quarterly, monthly, only a year. It really is a function of health, right? Because you're taking risk to retrain. There's a lot of risk to, to deploy models. So I love that answer. Um, yeah, and then the second part is, you know, I, so, you know, Logic's been around for 10 years here in town, and we, used to, we do a lot of presentations, and they've all been about the first part, which is how to build models, which we didn't talk about today. We're just assuming we have a model built. Like, there's a certain amount of, oh my gosh, can we just build these things, right? And now we're to the second phase, which is, hey, they're built, great, wonderful, you know, pat yourself on the back, but the data is constantly changing, constantly. You know, and Mary gave a bunch of great examples. And so now, when we build models, we're building them with uh, support, maintenance, and health, like in in the process. So yeah, we leave breadcrumbs. We are, you know, Mary had said, drift on X and drift on Y and drift on Y hat. And none of that may be the root cause. To Mary's point, like all of those are just indicators, and because a lot of times you're not going to get to the root cause just from the accuracy is, is poor. A lot of times, you're going to have to come back to the customer and, and have a conversation or dig into it. Um, and so, yeah, I would say that we're constantly leveling up our techniques in terms of uh, how do we monitor and, and what do we do when we build a new model to make sure that we can always answer the question of healthy or not. Yes. I have a question about um, the data that you're providing, do you rely solely on the data and, and the, what the data is from the client and not question that at all? Or do you have any sort of, like, let's say, do you have any knowledge base on, in that industry and on, at your company that may come in and say, well, maybe do you have this sort of data or do you have this type of data that you could provide to us? Yeah, we try. I mean, I think it really depends on the client engagement. So, um, you know, yeah, because we want that model. We're, we're on the hook for high accuracy. So we need to have the right data in place. So we'll try to do analysis in the front end. We do um, also kind of append in additional data. So we have data sources that we say, hey, this may be a value because we're not getting a lot from what you have because they may not have a lot. They, this is like, we want to do this, but this is all we have. So we may append in demographic and census data and whatever we have. Um, we do tend to work with some clients in repeat um, engagements or in, re in similar industries. So we've learned from some of them to say, hey, and then we always just ask, like, do you know, do you have this? Does any department have access to this? Because we, we, we can start seeing if that, if those relationships aren't strong and we're not getting those strong predictions, we know it's missing data and we want to have those conversations. He's taken more data. Can you give an example? Sure. Sure. So we're we're all you may not know this, but there are models that you are in right now. <laughs> um, so basically it's taking any data. So I'm gonna use like marketing because that's the one that we're all probably in databases. So there's information about you in a database. Some company has it because you made a purchase with them. So they may have um, you know, information about your name, where you live, what you purchase, how often, things like that. Well now, I, as the marketer, I, wanna, I want people to come buy this product. I want them to buy this bottle of water here. Well, who do I need to target for that? Well, let me look at all the people who purchased that bottle of water in the past. Okay, now let's find all the people that look just like them, because I know they probably want water. So now I'm going to target. The model is going to say, how likely or how similar are you or, or X amount of people this in my database to what I'm looking for? So it's trying to find um, those kind of similar behaviors to get to that target behavior. They really want to target a behavior or outcome. And so 
Um, so we take all that data, we, we, we find the people who actually did the thing of interest, and then we create a model to find other people like that, or other things like that, or other images, or um, you know, information like that. And then, but over time, the database can change. The people who want water may change. So that's when we would have to retrain the model to say, okay, what do people who, who want water look like now? What, who are they today? So that we can now target them and make sure we're targeting the right people. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> I have a, uh, MLOC that does a continuous chain pipeline looking at some of the KPIs that you described here. One KPI that I'm thinking about introducing because I'm concerned a little bit about the growth of computational costs is just the cost of the <coughs> training, not so much the execution of the training or the retraining. My question is, how do you balance over-optimizing feature engineering post hoc in a way that might reduce agility, and how far down can we actually drive that scale? So we're, we're scaling super linearly, and there's a belief that some people have that it's possible to scale linearly, and I don't believe that's all true. I'm not sure. I mean, I think that's a great question. I'm, I'll answer part of it. I think Matt will answer the scaling part. but. Um, for us, we try to go data driven. Like, you know, if you're over, if you keep retraining, you're really kind of you, you risk overfitting. You risk missing the target altogether. So we want to make sure that it's stable. So we try to. That's why we're trying to move towards this data driven. Like, if everything looks good, if the probabilities look good, if the accuracy is in in the range of expectation, if all the features look good. Um, then we're, we're, we're good with the model. We're not gonna spend those resources and, and worry about other implications that that can cost. Um, but as far as scale, Matt, do you wanna talk towards that? Uh, yeah, I, and just to make sure I get the question. So it, it's the trade-off of uh, the cost of feature engineering and having that as being part of the prediction pipeline. Uh, it's, it's the, we, we do a continuous, human loop continuous retraining. Okay. To, to, to do kind of, as the world changes, yeah. in this specific case, it changes frequently. And so we, we have like a trade over time window, so we can retrain the data frequently. But as the number of users grows, the features have mostly stayed the same as we built the original model. Um, the, the scale, the people is scaling larger than. So it's not O and N times N features times users, but it's actually, you know, it seems to be larger than that. I'm trying to understand if it's supposed to be, like if, it, if it's possible to drive it down to your old users, or if that's unrealistic. I, uh, I, I'm not sure. I fully understand exactly the scenario. Um, my closest data point would be, um, at least the, the problem that we run into, I would say, is specifically the feature engineering and scale is, you know, when you're when you're building a model on static data, there's a there's a very common trap, which is you can you can engineer to your heart's content complexity at what we would call in the lab time. But if you don't have the time or the compute or the resources to do that at inference time, you end up putting yourself in a bind because you can't you can't deliver the model, you can't deliver the predictions because the features take too long to compute. I don't think that's exactly what you're getting at, but I, and I don't I don't need to drill into it. But I will say there's a really great uh, anecdote on this front, which is everybody remembers the Netflix million dollar challenge. Anybody remember that? The, the model that was awesome was so good and it won and they couldn't use it because it was too computationally inefficient to actually drive predictions in Netflix, you know, to, to serve up good recommendations. Um, that's me kind of avoiding the question. I like it. It was good. Throw it. <laughs> last one. Just want to know about uh, the frameworks platform technologies language that you use uh, to create the models with like Sure. I mean, I'll throw the the obvious ones out that we the majority majority is Python, and then we're almost I think fully now Azure or cloud cloud based anyway. Um, so, but I don't know if you want to. There's other for for predictive models. Yeah, I mean, for the data science stack, I think you won't find anything totally different than what you might expect. Like definitely the Python base. NumPy, SciPy, Scikit-Learn is a pretty standard branch. Um, 
in the GPU or like the language and image modeling, like I feel like month by month, you'll find a different front runner and we just jump from hugging face to whatever NVIDIA is on top of. There's a lot of options and uh, constantly changing. And so, you know, we, there's definitely a broad technology base there. Um, again, the challenge there, I would say, is like in the lab, maybe you can use GPUs, but using, you know, deploying into Azure on container instances, maybe your GPU that supports that fancy model isn't supported. Um, so there's lots of inference time challenges, um, which obviously keep the field really interesting. But, uh, but yeah, it, you know, notebooks, um, you know, I guess there's nothing that I don't think you'd find from just Googling data science tools. Yeah. So kind of related, I mean, you see certain trends you track them for your company in terms of skill sets and people. So our company, for example, um, initially established itself as an R shop, and uh, uh, it seems like Python yeah. is more of the industry standard. It seems like it, and, and, and you know, we, uh, I don't know. I'm an R user, software, so. Right? <laughs> I just thought about for Julia, like, I feel like that, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Julia, but it's, it was supposed to be the next coming up Python. But um, I just feel like, you know, the reason why we hitch on the Python is because of the community base. Like, it just has such a reject ecosystem, and it's a flexible language, all that's great. I really don't, there's no curly braces, fantastic, whatever, but it really is the ecosystem. I would use, we would use R if it had the ecosystem that was more production-minded than research-minded. That's why we, I mean, R, we can't, like, we gotta make sure we can get this stuff into applications, right. and not just, you know, I'm not, uh, I like R too. No, no, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Yeah, right. no. <laughs> but definitely, like, we gotta get it from the lab into some sort of system and so python just has a pretty good tool set and pretty good support across you know cloud providers all that good stuff and that's part of the discussion we've been having recently is that python seems to have more potential for more operational related types of applications yeah. more integration into web apps and other types of backend and apis and you can google it as well. Yeah, you go Stack Overflow and you're going to find 10 people with your same general question. Like, it's, it's just, yeah, I just feel like, and to us it's a tiebreaker for a company our size. You know, we don't want to be reinventing anything. We want to be taking what's working, tried and true, and applying it to our customers' problems. So are you talking about future engineering as it relates to some of those KPIs? Do you, have you seen any relationship between hyperparameters? Uh, can you talk a little bit more about hyperparameters? Yeah, like the, uh, the, the, the two to one simulation of the training system or the hugging thing, or about like, the, the specifics that it uses to engage in the training. We haven't gotten there yet. So again, this is a, we're on this um, kind of maturity curve, right? So we're starting, but that's really interesting to me. So can like, can you talk a bit about some ideas you have, like what may be valuable there? But I, my hypothesis is that no, that there is no relationship. And there shouldn't be in theory, but I think in practice there may be, and that's why I was asking. Okay. No, it's cool. It's a cool thought and uh, definitely something we can explore to just make sure that that's not the case. I, in my, yeah, like, I think in my mind it shouldn't, but. From a pure data science perspective, the statistic that that should have no any other questions well I appreciate you guys I hope you enjoy the rest of your time get a some sweating on outside in the sweltering heat in Florida sun. <laughs> uh, but Matt and I will hang back for a bit if you guys wanna, if anyone has anything uh, else they wanna talk about. But otherwise, appreciate y'all. Thank you. Thank you.